Good day, everybody. Welcome uh, to Rocky Mountain Readings, where uh, last week we uh, finished one book and jumped into a new book. Uh, on Thursday, we jumped into the Talmud, a biography, banned, censored, and burned, the book they couldn't suppress. And uh, I really uh, enjoyed the reception we got with uh, Thursday's uh, first uh, reading uh, uh, starting off, and uh, we hope that that continues. We hope everybody's enjoying what we're sharing. It's a great introduction to what the Talmud is, where it came from, the whole biography of what it's all about. So uh, hopefully B'nai Noah can uh, begin to ponder if they're ever going to look at such, why they would be doing such, and for the right reasons. So, um, yeah, with that in mind, let's continue to jump in and keep reading uh, from the Talmud of Biography. So, uh, yeah, we uh, left off right here on Thursday, uh, Chapter 3, Returning to Babylon. <clears throat> Rabbi uh, Mershar Sheya told his sons, better to sit on the dung heap of Mata Mashia than in the play palaces of Pumbatita. Uh, the life in Babylon... The seeds of the Talmud were sown long before it was dreamt of in 587 BC. Uh, that was when the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar invaded ancient Israel, destroyed the Jerusalem temple, and resettled its population in his kingdom. That was their practice, for sure. Amongst them was the prophet uh, Jeremiah, who advised the uprooted families to build houses and to dwell in them, plant gardens and eat their fruit, and seek the peace of the city. The forced exile didn't last long. Uh, less than 50 years later, the Babylonian Empire had fallen, wiped out by Cyrus the Great, king of Persia. But although Cyrus uh, issued a decree allowing Nebuchadnezzar's captive nations to return home, not all that the exiled Jews did. Babylon, um, one of the world's leading cities with international trade, links, fabulous architecture, and the latest technology, offered a far more sophisticated lifestyle and much greater opportunity than the provincial backwater they now consider Jerusalem to be. Gee, such a shame. Hey, folks, I am expecting an important package I have to sign for. So if my doorbell rings, I got to step away just for a minute. So don't be alarmed if I have to. Um, it's just something I got to sign for, and I'm waiting on a package. So be FedEx. So, anyways, no longer exiles. Uh, the immigrants sank their roots deep into the Babylonian soil. Any guilt they may have felt at being seduced from their divinely bestowed homeland to a foreign heathen capital was canceled out by their pride in living in the land where Abraham had been born. Babylon was not Egypt. Moses hadn't told them they couldn't live there. The Jews remained in Babylon for thousands of years. A handful still remain today. Empires came and went. Alexander the Great conquered it, establishing his capital in the famed city. He died there in 323 B.C. Uh, after drinking a bowl full of suspect wine in the palace that Nebuchadnezzar had built nearly three centuries earlier. Alexander's death marked the beginning of Babylon's decline. A succession of warlords and invaders fought over it, gradually emptying the city of its population. Its once-famed ziggurats fell into desolation and ruin. Its hanging gardens throttled with weeds. Eventually, Babylon became as much of a cultural byway as the land from which the ancestors of its Jews had first hailed. <clears throat> just like Ur. Ur, yeah, just is a, a heap in the middle of a desert. Today, it's a ruin close to Baghdad in Iraq. The mist of time have concealed ancient Babylon. Babylon's Jews from view, but a second wave of immigration took place from the Holy Land in 135 CE. The Roman occupiers had brought about the second destruction of the temple 60 years earlier. Now they had savagely put down a revolt led by uh, Shimon Bar Kokhba, uh, an uprising which for three short years had kept the might of Rome at bay. Uh, when Bar Kokhba's forces could, could hold out no longer, Roman retribution was harsh and vicious. Judea, as the Romans called Israel, was in tatters. Those who had the resources to leave did. Many of them went to Babylon. Uh, it is from this time on that Babylonian Jews became more visible on the historical stage. Shalom, Dave. In those days, the ruling power in Babylon was the Parthian Empire. The Parthians, who hailed from Iran to the east, had driven out 
the warlords who had squabbled over the territory after Alexander the Great's death nearly half a millennium earlier. Uh, the Ixalarch, the Parthenian Empire, covered over a vast area encompassing almost all of modern Syria, Iraq, and Iran, the whole Levant to the coast. Their approach to government was fairly hands-off. They made no great demands of their subjects and delegated administrative powers to semi-autonomous regions run by local dynasties. One such dynasty was that of the Exilarch, a hereditary Jewish leader who claimed descent from King David. According to a letter written in the 10th century by a Jewish religious leader, uh, Sherira Gaon, to a correspondent in North Africa, the city of uh, uh, Keroan, uh, the first exilarch, had been the biblical king uh, Jeho Ho Jehoiakim of Judah. He had been taken in, into exile in the first wave of captives whom Nebuchadnezzar had transported to Babylon, ten years before he destroyed the temple. Shirira's uh, letter to the source for much of our information about the early Babylonian community. Of course, a letter written 1,500 years after the event, even one ascribed to a premier rabbinic authority, is not the same as evidence from a contemporary source. The earliest evidence we have of an exilarch comes from the 4th century CE, long after uh, Jehoiakim's time. The problem is that, unlike the Jewish community in Israel during the Talmudic times, the history of which is well attested in archaeology and Roman literature. The only major source of information about the Jewish Babylonian community uh, in the Talmud itself. As uh, Seth Schwartz points out, nearly everything we know about the historical environment of the Talmud must be wrestled from the Talmud itself. We only know that the Talmud tells us, and we have very little other historical context to set it against. <coughs> Sources such as uh, Sharira's uh, letters do not constitute hard evidence. As Ivan Marcus writes, medieval chroniclers were not historians. The facts they chose to recount and the way they presented them were intended only to support their own theological and cultural view. It's an important point. not to provide an objective reality. Uh, Jeho Jehoiakim uh, may not have had the title Exilarch, but he was an ex-king and would have been held in high regard by those who were exiled with him. In 1939, archaeologists found cuneiform tablets listing the ra rations of oil and barley given ca to captives in Babylon. Jehoiakim, king of the land of Judah, is listed as one of the recipients. He almost certainly retained his personal authority, and perhaps he had some degree of autonomous power over his former subjects. Whether this authority was handed down through the descendants is harder to know. The origins of the auxiliary or, or exilearchy were just as likely to lie in power struggles over the years between wealthy families who had grown rich in the silk trade. Jehoiakim uh, was a descendant of King David, whose monarchy it was believed would one day be reestablished. The Exilarchs also claimed David, David, Davidic descendant. Uh, this gave them quasi-royal status. Uh, they enjoyed all the trappings of power and wealth, including an armed force that allowed them to enforce their will. The Exilarch was, an ans was answerable to the emperor and was responsible for the good governance and administration of the communities under his control. His powers, which varied depending on who was running the empire at any particular time, would have included the right to appoint judges, impose capital punishment, and collect taxes. He could also appoint an agronomous or an overseer who took responsibility for the smooth functioning of the markets, including regulating weights and measures and controlling prices. There are accounts in the Talmud of measures to prevent overcharging or deceptive practices by traders. The distance from Israel to Babylon is a little over 500 miles. Even in those days, it was a relatively easy journey. There had always been contacts between the Jewish communities in the two countries dating back to temple times when the courts in Israel dispatched messengers to announce the sighting of a new moon and the festival calendar 
for the coming months. From at least the first century BCE, young scholars would travel from Babylon to study in the land of Israel. Indeed, according to legend, it was from Babylon that Hillel, the first Nasi, had originally hailed. Seeking to establish a new life for himself as a scholar in Israel, but too poor to enroll in the study house, the newly arrived Hillel had climbed onto the roof and listened to the lectures through the skylight shivering in a snowstorm until the outline of his freezing body cast a shadow inside he was brought down to thaw out the founding of the academy in nahardia uh, shira gaon's letter also tells us that the exiled king jehoiakim founded the first school for religious study in babylon in the town of nahardia the largest of the jewish settlements according to uh, shira Jehoiakim and the prophets who had been exiled with him had built the academy using clay and stone that they had brought from the Jerusalem temple. Again, we have to take this with a pinch of salt. It's not likely that a, th a throng of captives in the 6th century BC were able to transport building materials with them. The first we hear of Nahardia, Nahardia is when the Mishnah mentions Rabbi Akiva traveling there to announce the onset of a leap year. This would have been around the end of the first century CE, and it's the earliest record of an academy in Babylon. Akiva was a seasoned traveler, but it couldn't have been an easy trip for him. When he arrived in Nahardia, it he was approached by certain uh, a, a certain Nehemiah of Betdali, who complained that he had been unable to travel in the opposite direction because the country was swarming with troops. Akiva had clearly considered that showing his support for the academy in Nahardia was worth the hazards of the journey. In the 3rd century CE, an intense young lanky scholar arrived from the land of Israel. <clears throat> like Hillel, he had born, been born in Babylon, had gone to Israel to study, and had made a name for himself. Now he was returning home. His name was Abba. His friends gave him the nickname Abba Arika or tall Abba, about everyone, but everyone knew him as Rav. Rav was a title, an honorific, which uh, acknowledged his intellectual prowess and depth of learning. It corresponded to the title Rabbi used in Israel, just as Judah the Nasi was known simply as Rabbi, Rav was considered to be so distinguished that no name was necessary, all he needed was the title. When Rav arrived in Hardia, he found a flourishing academy. He worked there as an interpreter and was appointed market commissioner by the exilarch. But he soon outgrew the job. Leaving Nahardia, he found a new, founded a new academy further down the Euphrates at Sura. From that time on, the Nahardian and Surin academies would compete with each other for prestige. The head of the Nahardian Academy, Shmuel was esteemed as highly as Rav, and they frequently differed on matters of law. Their disagreements sharpened the acuity of debate between the two academies. Prior to Rav's arrival, the Babylonian students had considered their educational level inferior to that of counterparts in Israel. Now the intellectual rivalry between Nahardia and Sura uh, boosted their self-esteem. And not just in matters of learning, Rav himself pointed out to his students the difference between Babylon and the other major Jewish diaspora centers. Babylon is healthy, uh, Messene is dead, Medea is sick, and Elam is dying. Babylon's flourishing reputation probably contributed to the new wave of immigrants who arrived from Israel early in the 3rd century. Uh, they left their homeland due to ongoing economic and political difficulties of life under Roman occupation, hoping to make a fresh start elsewhere. A message sent around this time from Israel uh, to the Jewish authorities in Babylon asked them to take care of the sons of the poor, for the Torah proceeds from them. Since the Torah was regarded as emanating from Zion, another uh, name for Jerusalem, the sons of the poor, must have been immigrants who were on their way to Babylon to carve out a new life for themselves. In the year 226, the Parthenian Empire fell, brought to its knees by dynastic struggles. The coup de grace was delivered by 
the Sassanid communities in the, the Sasanian Empire would fluctuate between peaceable and intolerable over the coming centuries. Fire, earth, and water have a special sanctity in the Zoroastrian religion, and their priests, or uh, Haburim, were zealous in uh, prescribing their use for secular purposes. The Talmud recounts stories of fire priests forbidding the lighting of fires or seizing candles from Jewish homes, even if these were only being used for domestic purposes. There were even tales of corpses exhumed from their graves since dead bodies were deemed to violate the sanctity of the ground. Nevertheless, as Isaiah Gaffini points out, these troublesome incidents in no way compared to the wholesale prosecution taking place in, the Roman, in Roman Palestine. With the exception of the, the frenzied Kurdid, a 3rd century Zoroastrian priest who was overzealous in imposing his faith strictry, strictures on the minority populations, relations between the Sasanians and their non-Zoroastrian uh, subjects seem to have been relatively benign. Indeed, the Talmud recounts amicable contracts between leading Jewish rabbis and the Sasanian rulers, particularly between Shmuel and King Shapur I. And although these accounts may be exaggerated, they do suggest a general atmosphere of political and religious tolerance. Things would change with the ascent of King Yazdegerd II in the middle of the 5th century. Land and Rivers. Shalom, Ashley G. The Jewish settlements in Babylon were located in an area bordered by the rivers Euphrates and Tigris, the mythical site of the Garden of Eden. Genesis identifies one of the four rivers in that utopian land as the Euphrates, and an ancient Bible tradition renders the other as Tigris. The area forms part of the Fertile Crescent, which stretches north from the Persian Gulf through Iraq to the southern border of Turkey, then turns to follow the Mediterranean coast across Syria, Lebanon, and Israel to the Nile Delta and Valley. The two Babylonian rivers were connected by a network of tributaries and canals. Water flowed in abundance. A statement by Rav in the Talmud suggests that the land was so well irrigated that even when the rains failed, its harvests, harvests were secure. Shalom, Imam. The rivers played an important part in daily life. Dotted with towns along their length, the watercourses function as modern highways transporting people and goods. Inundations could be sudden and unpredictable. Rivers might change their course, swallowing up agricultural land. Uh, the big problem, though, in that land was the silt, the silt that washed down that allowed the land to be uh, highly uh, irrigatable, irrigable. Um, the silt, you know, became decimated and it became too... Uh, uh, <coughs> What do you call it uh, when the land is uh, oh too uh, acidic or uh, yeah, and uh, that's what caused like the fall of Ur, the 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 canals and the things they banked on the silt uh, uh, levels uh, were utilized and the the uh, yeah the land be had, went through years of decline in 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 wheat and uh, they relied on barley because of that but nonetheless. Uh, the irrigation of that land was uh, what you know promoted their definitive uh, growth going all the way back into the third millennia for sure, maybe even the fourth millennia BC. Okay, let's keep going. Um, inundations could uh, be sudden and predictable. Rivers might change their course, swallowing up agricultural land. There are even instances of barren fields becoming fertile through the sudden deposits of alluvial soils. Yeah, that's when silt was came down the the talmudic discussions question discusses questions such as water disputes and the ownership of items washed up by floods most people lived modest lives but owning a small amount of land typically one or two fields seems to have been quite common when a couple married the husband was obliged to make provisions for his wife in the event of his death the Talmud discusses how a widow is to collect her money in a case when her husband has made out his will in favor of his children from a previous marriage. Yeah, yeah, I've read uh, a lot of these ancient, uh, you know, uh, Sumerian uh, uh, laws. You can see a lot of overlapping with uh, uh, Bible rulings for sure. 
um, especially you go back to um, the old Code of Hammurabi, which, you know, in that area predates the time they're talking by about 1,500 years. <laughs> yeah. The solution is for her to distrain upon the children's landed property, but not upon their chattels. This could only work if most people own land. The solution would have been pointless if they didn't. The ownership of the, the little land they had was not absolute. One of the two principal taxes that the Sasanian rulers levied on their subjects was the tasca, a form of ground rent. Uh, when they paid the tasca, people effectively had the right of ownership of their land. If they did not pay, they would be evicted. Owning land doesn't seem to have a big deal in most people's eyes. It appears to have been a completely natural state of affairs. We can see this in the context if we compare the Talmud with the Roman law code, Justinian's Digest, or the Sicinian equivalent, the Book of a Thousand Judgments. Only two of the Talmud's 530 chapters deal with questions of land inheritance. The other works uh, each devote more than a third of their content to the same subject. Most people who lived off the land were small holders or tenant farmers, mainly growing dates, grains, and rice, or rearing sheep and goats. But even though they lived in the idealized land, which gave rise to the myth of the Garden of Eden, uh, we shouldn't picture a pastoral scene in which everyone tilled their own fields with crops growing in abundance. Poverty seems to have been rife. Ten measures of poverty descended into the world. Nine of them were taken by Babylon. Uh, still, despite the poverty, it was possible to advance economically. Not everyone farmed a small holding. Uh, the Talmud frequently introduces us to tanners, weavers, tailors, cobblers, uh, bloodletters, and even camel drivers, although the latter seem to have been less prominent than in Israel. The camel, which in the, go in the Gospels cannot pass through the eye of a needle, is an elephant in the Babylonian Talmud's Proverbs. Interesting. Not everyone was poor. Large estates were owned by families who had been settled in the area for generations, long before the tide of immigrants began to swell. The family of the Exilarch owned tremendous estates, much of which they rented out to tenants. The trading city of Mahosa, situated on the caravan routes on the Tigris in the center of the area of settlement, was fabled for its good living and its wealth. It was rumored that whilst the, in the whole city of Nadara, Ned, Nehardia, only 24 women possessed a golden cronet, 18 such owners could be found in a single alley in Mahosa. Unlike uh, their colleagues in Israel, who often eked out a living as workmen or artisans, uh, many of the scholars in Babylon were of independent means, typically owning larger than average land holdings. Not having to worry too much about earning a living gave them the freedom to study, but it could also lead to divisions with working people. Still today, such is the case. The rabbinic elite was only a small segment of the overall population. Richard uh, Kalman argues that the Babylonian scholars, at least in the early parts of the Talmudic period, were much more detached from the general population than their counterparts in Israel who were integrated into the general community. He puts this down to differences between Persian and Roman society, but wealth would have played a part as well. Kalman suggests that Babylonian scholars Oh, sorry guys, forgive me. I'm uh, still at the tail end of this COVID and uh, just wants to hang around a little bit. Hey, Cookie Monster, shalom. Good to have you with us. Okay. Kalman suggests that Babylonian scholars were internally focused, avoiding contact and marriage with non-rabbinic Jews, and reluctant to admit them into the scholarly, scholarly environment. He likens them to monks who managed to be both disassociated and part of the world, detached from society in certain contexts and capable of exercising a leadership role in others. But at least the rabbis seem to have been aware of their aloofness. 
In a discussion about why so few scholars produce children who became learned men, we find four different but equally revealing opinions. Rav Yosef said it was so that the scholarly classes could not claim to have a hereditary right to the Torah. Very important. Rav Shishida said it was so that scholars would not have an arrogant attitude toward the community. Marzutra said it was because they acted uh, high-handedly against ordinary folk, whilst Rav Ashi said it was because they called people asses. Whatever the case is, uh, there's nothing worse than when there's a separation between leaders and uh, and, and uh, uh, seekers of uh, uh, religious uh, truth. Um, that when that gap is put in place, it's always uh, a, a problem in the community for sure. <clears throat> Standoffish they may have been, but the Babylonian rabbis didn't live in a cultural vacuum. They didn't just study religion and law. Ancient Babylonia, Babylon was renowned for its mathematical and astronomical knowledge and its complex systems of magic and demonology. The Talmud is replete with passages on these subjects. From calculations of the size of the earth and the thickness of the sky to legends about demons and medicinal cures. Although mention of mythical creatures can be found in many branches of ancient Jewish literature, the Babylonian Talmud, under the influence of the local culture, takes a particular interest in them. We also find formula for spells and incantations in the Talmud, the wording of which is often similar to the inscriptions found on magic bowls, a uniquely Babylonian practice in which earthenware vessels inscribed with enchantments were placed in the earth to guard against demons. The similarity of language suggests that Jews were involved in the production of these bowls, perhaps for their own use or because the local Persian population considered the Jews as particularly skilled in getting rid of demons. Zoroastrian superstitions also accounted for a passage in the Talmud which, ur which urges the burying of cut fingernails, or at very least burning them and not simply throwing them away. This must be avoided lest a pregnant woman steps over them and miscarries. But spells and magic, astronomy and mathematics were probably light relief for the Babylonian rabbis. They were known as the condiments of wisdom. Tasty appetizers, but a bit of luxury. The real hard work, the essential curriculum in the Babylonian academies, was the detailed analysis of the minute of law. Everything else was simply icing on the cake. The compilation of the Talmud. Yeah. Rabbi Tarfan said, the day is short and there is much work. The workmen are lazy, but the wages are high, and the masters of the house is pressing. The academies in Babylon. The starting point for every discussion in the Babylonian academies was the Mishnah. A structured work which is arranged systematically under six main headings, each one containing many subcategories. But we can assume that the discussion in the academies rarely remained on, the, on topic it's highly likely that they would digress often wildly. To appreciate this, we can think of a class of student, school students discussing, let's say, a Midsummer Night's Dream with an enlightened teacher. On the face of it, the task of the class is to ana analyze the text in front of them, but their observations might easily become a launching pad for discussing, discussions about love, uh, fairy lore, theater, ancient society, magical potions, loss of personal identity, and much else. The play itself would simply be the place they started. Yes, and that's what they have. All the arguments back and forth. And this is where a lot of the wisdom is, is actually hammered out. It's forged uh, when you take a topic and you, uh, you, you beat down through it and you, you hit at it from every angle possible. We find a similar thing happening over and over again in the Talmud. There is a passage in the Mishnah that deals with the water drawing ceremony in the temple, a spectacular public ceremony during the tab Tabernacles Festival. The Talmud starts its dis discussion of this subject logically enough with a description of the temple where the ceremony took place, but then rapidly digresses into an excursion 
which surveys a uh, basilica synagogue in Alexandria, discusses the Messiah, considers the nature of evil, strong men, and demonology, before turning to juggling world peace and the physical depth of the earth. However, unlike our fictional classroom discussion on a midnight sum, mid, Midsummer Night's Dream, the four densely printed pages of Talmudic text which discuss the water-drawing ceremony do not record the deliberations of a single academy session. The printed discussions didn't even take place in a single generation or in one location. It contains, this is so important, if you're ever going to look at the Talmud, it contains contributions from people who lived a century or more apart, who taught in different academies, even in different countries, the lands of Babylon and Israel, Okay, um, this is because the Talmud is a literary construction which debates opinions, proofs, and rulings that took place over nearly 300 years are woven together by late, later editors into a coherent whole. And we can assume that the individual discussions in the academy were equally varied in their scope because if they had been rigidly focused on a single subject, it is highly unlikely that their structure would have been broken up and recorded for posterity in such a wide-ranging and discursive manner. The formal sessions in the academy or yeshiva took place in a large hall. The head of the academy would sit at the front on a pile of cushions or a settle in the students would sit in rows in front of him. The number of rows wasn't fixed. In one place we read of an academy with 17 rows, but the preferred number seems to have been seven with 10 people in each mirroring uh, the numbers and seating pattern in ancient uh, Sanhedrin. As we have already seen, the vineyard at Yavne may have been called that because the scholars sat there in rows like vines. The term students is a little misleading, okay, because many of the participants in the yeshiva sessions were distinguished scholars in their own rights even if they were subordinate to the head of the academy. The most senior scholars would sit in the front row, the younger participants to the rear. As students progressed in their studies, they would gradually be brought towards the front. It was a bit like the arrangement uh, in old school rooms where pupils at, sat at the front, middle, or back of the class, depending on their ability. The academy head would have a memory man alongside him, known as the Tana. Uh, he was a scholar who could be called on at a moment to recite a passage by heart, usually from the Mishnah, but occasionally from the Tosefta, which, as we saw earlier, Rabbi Hia had compiled out of material which hadn't been included in the Mishnah. The Tana's uh, prodigious memory also contained a uh, mental database of biblical commentaries uh, dating from the same early period. All this material, which was not in the Mishnah, but had emanated from the same schools, was known as Baratia, which means external. The passage as... that the Tana would be asked to search his memory for played a central part in the argument that the academy head was presenting and the Tana was the closest he could get in the ancient world to having a database for reference at his fingertips. Very interesting. In a large gathering, the head of the yeshiva would also have someone known as an Amora. His own hand, oh, an Amora who acted as his mouthpiece, declaiming his words loudly so that everyone could hear. The terminology is confusing because the scholars of the Talmudic period are also known as Amoraim. A similar confusion exists with the term Tana, which refers to both the rabbis of the Mishnaic period as well as to the memory men of the Talmudic era. The participants in each session would have prepared the material to be discussed in advance. Frequently, the head of the academy would be challenged by one of the students and debate would ensue in which the protagonists would make their points either by logic, by appeal to a biblical verse, or by calling upon the Tana to recite a passage from the earlier literature that they had hoped would uh, clinch the argument for them. The study sessions weren't always as dry and formal as they sound. 
A weird account in the Talmud tells the story of Rav Kana, an experienced Babylonian scholar who had been forced to flee from the Sasanian authorities after taking it into his own hands to impose the death penalty on, his, on an informer. His teacher, Rav, advised him to go to Israel to Rabbi Yohanan's academy in Tiberias. Rav counseled him to keep his head down and not challenge uh, Yohanan's authority. Unfortunately, Kana found it difficult to blend into the background. The first time he had attended a session, he kept raising objections to the assertion that Yohanan had made. Yohanan, as befitting the head of an academy, was sitting at the front on seven cushions. Every time Kana scored a point against him in the debate, a cushion was pulled from under Yohanan until eventually he was sitting on the ground. At this point, Yohanan was so enraged that he pronounced a curse upon Kana, who dropped dead some days later. Yohanan, full of remorse, went to Kana's tomb. It was guarded by a snake. Yohanan had to pronounce three separate charms on the animal before he could enter. Once inside, Yohanan sought Kana's forgiveness and prayed that he would be brought back to life. His unfortunate victim only agreed to be revived on the condition that Yohanan promised that the same thing would not happen again to, should Kana happen to be, best him in future debate. This odd story has been the subject of considerable analysis by both ancient and modern scholars. Nobody argues that we should take it literally, and several ac academics have argued that it is in fact a polemic which weaves together Persian motifs and stories from different periods, including uh, a boast about the superiority of uh, Babylonian scholars over those in Israel. But it needn't be as complicated as this. Babylon was a place of mystery and magic. It could just have been a story that was told and retold because people believed it was true. Twice a year, the academics would put on a major public event. During the months preceding the spring and autumn harvests, when uh, there was little else to do but wait for the crops to grow, hundreds of teachers, lay scholars, and graduates um, of the yeshivas would leave their homes and travel to the nearest academy. Uh, these month-long study sessions, known as Kala, were carefully orchestrated. Everyone knew what subject was to be studied and should have spent the week's since the previous sessions memorizing the material and coming to grips with its meaning. As the years passed, the discussions held by one generation of scholars would become material to be studied by the next. In the time of Rav and Shmuel, the only material available to be studied was the Mishnah and other works dating from the same period. Ah, uh, you see how that practice uh, became uh, a fodder for the next generation and how it... Uh, yeah, interesting. Succeeding generations would have included Rav and Shmuel's analysis in their curriculum, and their discussions would in turn be pulled apart in due course by succeeding cohorts. The style of material changed from one generation to another. Uh, David Weiss uh, Halivni points out that the earliest teachings were not unlike the terse style of the Mishnah, laying down uh, absolute rulings on the law. As time passed, elapsed and the quantity of material grew, the latter Bab Babylonian Amorim grew more interested in why rather than what. They wanted to know the rationale that lay behind those rulings. They were rigidly logical in their analysis. They had no patience with incoherent thinking. When Rav Naaman, who lived half a century after Rav and Shmuel, heard of a ruling from the Mishnah that a, a guarantor for a loan cannot be forced to pay up, it made no sense to him if that was the case, what would have been the point of guaranteeing the loan? <coughs> he complained that it was like a law of the Persians who don't give a reason for their decisions. As Weiss, as Weiss Halivni put it, the Talmud prefers law that is expressly reasonable that seeks to win the hearts of those to whom the laws are addressed. Very important point. 
But the Talmud knows that not everyone cares about reasons. They just want to know how to act. We find a similar conflict among the Greeks in response to Plato's arguments that laws had to be explained so that they wouldn't be just uh, uh, brusque injunctions. Seneca had responded, tell me what I have to do. I do not want to learn. I want to obey. The Talmud gives uh, its versions of this dilemma in a story about the Israelites at Mount Sinai. When Moses tells them that they are to receive the Ten Commandments, they say, we will do and we will listen. This means, says the Talmud, that the, they pledged their obedience even before they understood what was involved. Nashma Venishma, they say. Yeah. As a reward for their trusting loyalty, 600,000 angels descended from heaven and gave them each two crowns, one for their promise to do and the other for their promise to listen. A few weeks later, when Moses had failed to return from the mountaintop on the day they expected him, they assumed he was dead. They lost their faith in God and made themselves a golden calf. And when Moses did return and found that their reasoning had got the better of their loyalty twice, as many angels came down and took the crowns away. Words and deeds. People might have thought them aloof, and they probably were detached from mainstream society. But the heads of the academies and their leading students didn't spend their whole lives in ivory towers. They were called upon to intercede in local disputes, and some were appointed by the exilarchs as judges for their town. And why not? You know, they were the scholars, right? Of course, the Sasanian authorities were the ultimate arbitrators arbiters of the law, and there was always the possibility that the demands of the empire might come into conflict with the oral law. To keep such differences to a minimum, Shmuel introduced a landmark ruling known as uh, uh, Dina Melchuda Dina, that in all areas of civil and monetary law, the law of the state is the law. This applied in every area of life other than religious law. If Jewish civil law came into conflict with Sassinian law, Sassinian law prevailed. Minorities throughout history with their own customs and traditions have established similar principles is a necessary precondition for preserving cultural identity and a degree of autonomy. This is very important to understand because there's so many people today that scream for freedoms uh, and they don't realize uh, what they're what they're actually asking for. And they don't like the dictates, maybe, especially we saw a lot with the, uh, dealing with the, uh, the COVID crisis. There was a lot of... Uh, government injunction uh, that a lot of people had uh, uh, notions against, but you need to understand when one takes precedence over the other uh, or else you just end up in anarchy. The rabbinic courts heard cases on matters of religious and family law and educated in disputes, usually concerning land, money, or contracts. They had the power to levy fines, to act as legal guardians for orphans, to rule on ownership of disputed items, and to dispose of expropriated property. They also had the power to ostracize or excommunicate offenders, although this was an extreme sanction, rarely applied. But although biblical law permitted capital punishment in certain cases, the rabbinic courts did not have this power. Not out of deference to the Sasanian jurisprudence, but because, according to the Jewish religious law, the sanction to condemn someone to death was only available to the Sanhedrin when the temple stood. And that's something to keep in mind, especially for those that are currently Christians listening to a lot of Noahide stuff, thinking that, you know, we're just all looking to behead Christians. You know, they missed the whole point. You know, you could, you could uh, suffer the, 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 the penalty, uh, uh, by decree of heaven, you know, and, uh, there's nothing higher than that uh, court. And, um, yeah. Despite their own roles as judges and interpreters of the oral law, the scholars in the academy rarely saw themselves as lawmakers. As we have saw, seen, a academic debate focused on the arguments underpinning the law, but scholars weren't much bothered about its practical application. 
Indeed, this disconnect between theory and practice is stated clearly in the Jerusalem Talmud in Shmuel's name, practical laws can't be learned from the outcome of debates in academy. If anything, the reverse was true. The practical law was established by way the judges acted. And this we, we know today as precedence. Right? So this is why courts, you know, run on precedence. Uh, in the past, it was ruled this way, and you don't want to undermine precedence. Um, yeah. On one occasion, Rav Asi, uh, a Babylonian scholar who'd gone to study in Rabbi Yochanan's academy in Israel, heard Atana recite, the law may not be derived from a theoretical conclusion unless one has been told that it is to be taken as a rule for practical decisions. So Asai uh, asked his teacher, when you tell us that something is the law, may we act on it accordingly? No, replied Yochanan. You cannot unless I say that it is a law that can be acted upon. On the other hand, a ruling by a court can be used to support a theoretical argument. And this is a real big key because I find often, especially Ben Noah, want to ask questions uh, and they're really looking for whether to the left or to the right. What's the right way I got to walk in? Hi, Zakia. Um, you know, and I keep telling uh, Ben Noah, if you're asking a rabbi a question, make sure you're clear. What's the halakha position of this? You're asking for an actual ruling. What's the ruling rather than an opinion? Um, yeah, so. Uh, a ruling by a court can be used to, to support a theor theoretical argument. And so you get caught in theory. And this is why often when you ask a rabbi a question, he'll, he'll respond with a question because he's clarifying the point you're, you're truly trying to get to. Are you trying to get to a theoretical you know, position or do you just want to know what to do? Um, yeah, in a discussion about how much space there needs to be between a group of trees for their purchaser to also auto automatically acquire the land on the, they stand on, one rabbi builds a case quoting from the Mishnah. His colleague overrules him by signing a court decision, but the outcome is the same, complains the first rabbi. Yes, comes the answer, but a real-life example is preferable. This principle crops up in the Talmud discussion about whether it is better for a person to study Torah or to go out and to perform good deeds. Learning Torah is considered a holy task, and according to one source, it outranks any good deed or acts of charity. The scholars debate the relative merits of a life of study or a life of good deeds. In their terminology, the question is framed as, what is greater study or action? <clears throat> it turns out that study is greater because study leads to action. In a nutshell, this sums up the Talmudic dilemma about decision-making. Decisions must be made, action is important, but even more important is why the decision is reached and what other valid possibilities were rejected along the way. Alternative points of view can exist side by side in the Talmudic worldview, and there is only one absolute truth. The rabbis never lost sight of the fact that their sole authority was divine the divine. In the face of that truth, everything else is relative to the circumstance. Yeah. It was their awareness of living in a created world which allowed the scholars of the academy to digress from discussion about the law without feeling they were being frivolous. The whole of nature is part of a coherent, divinely ordained, and immaculately governed system. Every aspect of which was revealed to Moses, it all fell within the scope of their investigation. And so about uh, a quarter of the Talmud is not law in the accepted sense at all. It belongs to a category for which there is no adequate English word and which is usually referred to negatively and unimaginatively as non-legal material. Technically, it is known as Agadah, which literally means storytelling, but although the Agadah contains stories in abundance, 
it is far more than just that. Much of the Agadah is devoted to explaining biblical texts, either to introduce new ideas or to make the teleological, theological point, but other sections contain fables, folklore, or discussions of the natural or supernatural worlds. We read a wonderful book earlier uh, uh, last year uh, by uh, Rabbi Abraham Heschel, Between God and Man, that really went into detail uh, uh, of an interpretation of Agadah in Judaism. On the face of it, the Agadah passages are less challenging than the legal sections, but they have attracted far less scholarly attention. But while it's true that they fully grasp the intricacies of the legal passages requires the ability to think logically, systematically, and to keep several steps of an argument in one's head at the same time. The Agadah contend a content needs a different sort of mind. It appeals to people whose skills lie in grappling with the ideas of abstraction, who are more in interested in looking at a conceptual framework than in the minute of an argument. Comparing the merits of the two types of material is a bit like comparing pure mathematics to philosophy. Our preference for one over the other depends on our interests and our skill. Well, Shalom, Patricia. Compiling the Talmud. The debates carried on in the academies for generations. Surah continued to be the major center, but the city of Nahardia was destroyed in 259 CE, uh, a causality of the frequent skirmishes between the Roman and Sasanian empires. By the time the town was rebuilt, its academy had moved further up the Euphrates to the northwest. It would still be called the Academy of Nahardia, but it was now located in a new home, in the town of Pumbedida, Pumbedida. New academies opened notably at the wealthy city of Mahosa, where the most well-known of its heads was Rava, who was in charge from around 320 onwards, along with his contemporary, Abe, who headed the college in Pumbedida. Rava is counted amongst the greats of Talmudic scholarship, <clears throat> Rava's relationship with the townspeople of Mahosa wasn't too good. On one occasion, he applied the prophet Amos's description of the people of Bashan who oppressed the poor, who crushed the needy, to the women of Mahosa who eat without working. On another, he criticizes a prominent doctor's family for not showing sufficient respect to the rabbis. These character insights are usually Generally, the personal lives of the rabbis are only passing interest to the Talmud unless they can be used to glean an ethical, religious, or legal point. Yeah, and this is, we find even today, people who try to seek the material out just to use for their own benefit, um, miss the whole point of having a, a, a circumcised heart and uh, are only for their own selfish gain. So, okay, such as the occasion when Rav Ashi, one of the last Amorim, broke a glass at a marriage ceremony, a custom which still prevails in Jewish weddings today. Rava has the furthest, further distinction of posing more problems than anyone else in which the solution is so finely balanced between two possibilities that neither can be preferred over the other. These problems, which conclude with the word uh, teku, meaning let it stand, will, <coughs> according to folklore, all be solved by the prophet Elijah in the utopian future. <coughs> in the meantime, both solutions to the problem are equally valid. There may only be one truth, but there can be multiple realities. And this is where people with tunnel vision never get it. They always create more problems than uh, than they solve because they they think they're chasing one sole answer uh, when in reality there's multiple realities and they're unable to see it from the other person's perspective. Around about the year 500 uh, CE, he debates in the academies. The debates in the academies give way to a process of rounding up all the material from the preceding centuries which circulated as verbal traditions, collating it, okay, and eventually editing into the Talmud. 
A hundred years earlier, harsh economic and political conditions in Israel had brought about premature completion of the Jerusalem Talmud, but the completion of the Babylonian Talmud doesn't seem to have been abrupt. There may even have been long periods of overlap during which the process of compilation had begun, even though the final discussions were still going on. It had never been the intention of the Amorim to have have their discussions collected into a literary compilation. They weren't working to fulfill a grand project. They studied to clarify. This is very important, folks. They weren't working to fulfill a grand project. They studied to clarify and explain the law, not go down into history. Something must have happened around the year 500 CE to make the scholarly elite feel it was necessary to draw the intellectual threads of centuries together into a single coherent form. The catalyst may have been turmoil within the Sasanian kingdom and upheavals in the local social environment. You also got to realize that that was right around the time when uh, uh, Rome had been completely sacked and... uh, never came back again. So the Roman Empire actually collapsed completely at around that, which would have, you know, changed the whole global uh, um, scenario as far as the global power. I think they were, yeah, sacked by uh, the barbarians from the north, and uh, they never came back. And then shortly thereafter, you end up with Europe being, forming the, the Holy Roman Empire which took over lands leading up to that great schism uh, in 1069 between East and West. Yeah. But this, uh, when the Roman uh, legions, when the army literally fell, uh, you could just see that uh, there would have been a new texture or face on the world in this uh, Sasanian kingdom uh, would have said, Oh, we've got no more opposition. Uh, Okay, the catalyst may have been turmoil within the Sasanian kingdom and upheavals in a local social environment. An uprising led by a Persian priest, Mazdak, who had led, had led to the Sasanian king being temporarily disposed. At around the same time, there was a brief successful attempt by the exilarch Marzutra to establish an autonomous state in Mahosa. None of these disruptions lasted long enough. The empire soon retook control. Order was eventually restored in both the Exilarch and his grandfather, Hanina, the head of the Talmud. Oh, Hanina, the head of the academy, were hanged on the bridge of Mahosa. It was a very unstable time. We don't know who compiled the Babylonian Talmud, nor how they went about it. The early medieval view, which is set out in Shira Gaon's letter, is that the final editors of the Talmud were Rav Ashi, who died in 428, and Rabina, who lived until 499, both of whom are described in the Talmud as being at the close of teaching. But it has long been recognized that this view is untenable, since they are both frequently mentioned in the Talmud, as indeed is Rav Ashi's son, Mar, and indeed Rav Ashi's encounter with the angel of death, It seems pretty clear that the editing process was still going on long after their time. It's a good uh, academic uh, statement for sure. Layers upon layers. For the last few centuries, readers have become become used to books which were written at one time by one person or occasionally a team of people. They begin at the beginning and end at the end. The Talmud is not like this. It contains layers of material from different places and different times, which have been woven together skillfully, almost seamlessly, in a more or less uniform manner. We can identify these layers by their language. For example, a change in the middle of a passage from Hebrew to Aramaic by their style and particularly through the use of keywords such as we learnt or an objection we raised, which flag up content that had been imported into the discussion. Interesting. There are at least four chronological layers of material in the Talmud, not counting over 8,000 biblical verses, which are woven into the narrative to explain, justify, or clarify a particular point. The base layer comprises quotation, 
from the Mishnah itself or from the other rabbinic literature of the same period, which we look at in chapter 1. The second layer, which makes up the core of the Talmud, comes from the study sessions in the Babylonian academies and is usually attributed to one of the scholars of the time. The third layer has no names attached. It is anonymous, connects everything together, and provides a framework for the discussion. The people who wrote this third layer are the original editors of the Talmud. Finally, there is another stratum of even later material, which was probably added after the first drafts of the Talmud were concluded. This layer tends to introduce a topic or to provide the logical conclusions of an argument. classic example demonstrating these layers occurs in a discussion on the laws of damage. Take care, Zakia. The section opens, as do all Talmudic topics, with a citation from the Mishnah in the first layer. This enumerates four principles, categories of damages, an anonymous editor, third, uh, maybe fourth layer, then points out that if these are called the principal categories, then there must also be secondary or derivative categories. The same voice asks whether the derivatives have the same standing in law as the principal categories. A view from Babylonian Academy in the second layer is then cited. Rav Papa said some of the derivatives are equal to their principles, whereas others are not. Finally, the editor, third layer, cite a number of tenetic first layer and Amoric second layer sources to clarify which derivatives Rav Papa considered equivalent to the principles and which he considered were not. <clears throat> the scale of the task facing the editors of the Talmud is hard to contemplate. Not only uh, did they have a vast amount of material to work with, most of it only existed orally. Yaakov Elman makes out a convincing case that not only the first two layers but even much of the third and fourth were handed down by word of mouth. Generation after generation, this method of oral transmission is known as Gamara. Oh, come on. I don't know why. Hey, I can't get my mouse. It's just not working properly, folks. Printed editions of the Talmud use this word, the Gemara, to separate the material that was composed in Babylon, second layer or later, from the introductory quotations from the Mishnah, from the, which is the first layer. At least some of the Talmud was written down by the 8th century. But most of it probably circulated in an oral form or another for 300 years. We don't know exactly when it was given when it was given its literary form. We don't even know if it was given a literary form before it was written down. Or if that was a consequence of the transcript transcription process. All we do know, now this is important, folks, all we do know is that the process was carried out by editors who, whether deliberately or not, managed to successfully conceal their identity. Uh, Lewis Jacob points out that, that nowhere in the Talmud is there any definite statement about the process of redaction and how it was done and by whom. To pull all the material together, the editors of the Talmud are likely to have worked in teams. Uh, Shama Fried, Friedman suggests that typically there would have been an arranger who fixed the early layers in place so as to construct the framework for the argument and the explainer who created the argument that linked the piece together, pieces together. The teams would have worked together for an extended period of time, older scholars handing over to younger ones as the generations passed. The process may have gone on for centuries. Yet for all its com complex composition, the Talmud appears to the reader to be a seamless work. It's not until uh, we analyze closely that we can see the joins between the layers. <clears throat> 
Although written in the Babel, Bab, written in Babylon, the Talmud can quote the opinions of people who lived their whole lives elsewhere. Yet it will have us think that they were standing in the same room as the native Babylonians. We don't know the names of the people who wove all this material together, and the nature of their work is such that when studying the Talmud, we are rarely aware of the scale or complexity of the task they undertook. But whilst the voices of the rabbis who are quoted in the Talmud echo throughout history to the modern reader, there is a second group of truly astonishing people, for there must have been many of them who pulled the whole thing together but have altogether disappeared from, the, from view. That's a humble service for sure. The Talmud contains many paradoxes, but this is surely the greatest paradox of all. Yeah, for sure. I don't know how far I can get here, but let's uh, keep going for another while longer, folks. The Flowering of Babylon. Ben Bag Bag said, turn in it and turn in it for everything is in it and gaze into it and grow old and weary in it and don't depart from it for you have no better measure than it. Ben Hey Hey said, according to the trouble, so is the reward. <clears throat> These are Mishnas, yes. Despite the immensity of the Talmud project, most 6th century Jews knew nothing of it. Much of the Hebrew nation had long since scattered from its ancestral homeland, and whilst great concentrations of the population could still be found in Israel, in the land they uh, uh, anachronistically called Babylon, their compatriots could now be found as far away as Spain and India and the Arabian Peninsula and even France. Most of them did not belong to the rabbinic elite. Uh, what bound them together was a common belief system, a common language, family ties, and too often a painful awareness of what it was to be part of a minority. They had their customs and traditions. They had their Torah and the holy writings. Of the Talmud, most of them were blissfully unaware. All that was about to change, but not because of anything they did. The Limits of Influence In the year 622, the Prophet Muhammad and his followers embarked on a series of military campaigns from their base at Medina in the Arabian Peninsula. Within a remarkably short period of time, the political and religious map of the Middle East would look very different. No nation, faith, or institution which fell under their influence would emerge unchanged. The Talmud was no exception. Muhammad had an extensive knowledge of Judaism and Jewish practice. This is clear from the Quran itself, as well as from latter commentaries and legends. He may even have been influenced by Jewish teachers. One legend has the prophet discussing the names of the stars in Joseph's dream with the sons of the exilarch Bustanai, of whom uh, we will soon hear more. At first, Muhammad instructed his followers to face Jerusalem when praying, as the Jews do, and he instituted a fast on the 10th day of the first month corresponding to the Jewish Day of Atonement. <coughs> when, he, when he eventually abandoned these practices, it was most likely the result of an early alliance with local Jewish tribes turning sour. Medina in modern Saudi Arabia is several hundred miles southeast of the land of Israel. Jewish tribes were among its earliest inhabitants, uh, Moshe Gill explains that the first Jewish settlers in the Arabian Peninsula were refugees from the Romans whose numbers increased as they converted the surrounding Ar Arabian tribes. Unlike the nomadic Bedouins with whom they shared the region, the Jews lived in walled towns and farmed uh, the lands, growing dates and vines. The Jewish tribes played an active role in the governance of Medea. In fact, their presence in the Arabian Peninsula was so influential that for a short period in the 6th century, the royal house of Yemen converted to Judaism. Early relations between Muhammad's followers and the Jews in the area were good. In the constitution of Medina, which Muslim sources describe as a pact between the Muslims and the Jews, Muhammad states that the Jews have their religion and the Muslims have theirs, but the uh, amity wouldn't, wouldn't last. Despite the con they had with the prophet, 
not all of the Jews of Medina warmed to the Islamic Revolution. Muhammad fought and won separate battles against three different Jewish tribes, expelling two of them, massacring most of the men in the third and the taking the women and the children into slavery. It has been argued that the hostility of the Arabian Jewish tribes to Muhammad was due to his alliances with dissenting Jewish sects. Our modern conception of religion prevents us from appreciating just how fluid the ancient faiths were. Major religions today have a clear set of doctrines. Okay, that's common today. Well-established rituals, clergy who are responsible for their faith's propaganda, and buildings dedicated to worship. But the early days of faith are rarely so well constructed. The history of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam is full of competing sects varying for influence. This is, yeah, we hear a lot of this come out of Rabbi Singer when he talks about early Christianity and the state of early Christianity. How, yeah, the fights and arguments between sects amongst themselves, yeah. The Talmud sat at the center of Jewish life in Babylon and Israel, but it was probably unknown to the remote desert communities. Even if the Jews of Arabia were aware of it, there was no reason to assume that its teachings remained unchanged as they diffused from the center of to the periphery of Jewish settlement. Far from it, the Talmudic centers were so distant from Arabia and the prevailing lifestyle is so different that we can imagine a local exotic Jewish culture which would have been virtually unrecognizable to a Jew from Babylon. The Mishnah had cemented the religious authorities of the rabbis amongst the Jewish communities in Israel and Babylon, but that wasn't the case elsewhere. The ideological victory that the Pharisees had gained over the Sadducees all those years ago, hadn't universally standardized Jewish belief and practice. Remember, they were still scattered abroad by the Roman, uh, uh, yeah, legions. Nor had the birth of Christianity stopped other Messianic groups from emerging within Judaism, the best known of whom were followers of the 8th century uh, sectarian Abu Issa. One of the ideological battles of the Talmud was yet to fight would be to bring dissenting Jewish groups, such as those in the Arabian Peninsula, within its sphere of influence. It was the spread of Islam over the next few centuries which allowed the battle to be won. <clears throat> Baghdad, city of culture. Once they had consolidated their stronghold in Arabia, the Prophet's followers moved to the challenge to challenge the powerful Sassanian and Byzantine empires to the north and east. The first assault against the Sassanians were in 633. Within a few years, the Islamic victory was complete. 400 years of Sassanian rule over Mesopotamia came to an abrupt end. From this stronghold in Medina, the, the uh, Caliph Umar was redrawing the map of the world. Umar's successor, the Umayyads, built upon his successes. I see, because the Romans were no longer there that allowed the Islamic uh, uh, regime to, to rise up. The, the, the cal caliphate grew rapidly by the middle of the 8th century. Muslim rule extended from Spain in the west across the whole of North Africa to Iran and, and India. But despite their territorial gains, the Umayyads could not suppress internal dissent. The Umayyad caliphate fell in 750 CE, defeated by the Abbasids, descendants of Muhammad's youngest uncle, Abbas ibn Abid uh, al-Mutalib. <clears throat> In one of those fortuitous accidents of history, al-Mansur, the uh, uh, Abbasid caliph, commissioned a new city to be built in his capital, as his capital. He chose a new name for it, uh, but people continued to refer to it by the name of the settlement that had previously stood there. They called it Baghdad. Had Al-Mansur not chosen Baghdad as the site of his capital, it is uh, quite possible that the history of the Babylonian Talmud would have run a completely different course. Um, it may not have even have run a course at all. <sighs> Baghdad's rise was brisk. Within a few years of its founding, it was echoing the former glories of Babylon, 
the ruins of which lay a day's journey to the south. Baghdad became a flourishing center of culture and knowledge, a dazzling capital of uh, honeyed bazaars and scented gardens, gilded palaces, and and gaily uh, bedecked caravans. Its citizens paraded through its market streets, garbed in colored silks and wools. Its air hung heavy with beguiling scents of exotic spices. The city's salacious romances and perfumed intrigues have been immortalized in the 1001 Nights, but its greatest achievements surpassed all sensual experiences. The Abbasid Caliphate regarded learning as one of the highest of virtues, an attitude that was embodied in the saying, the ink of the scholar is more holy than the blood of the martyr. From the 9th century onward, their capital, Baghdad, became a magnet for scholars from across the empire, deeply conscious that the Greek, that the language was a barrier to knowledge, that the Greeks had produced a branch of philosophical literature barely understood by Arabic speakers, and that an inward-looking Islamic empire risked losing sight of the wisdom and ideas of the great world cultures, that it was his ambition to surpass the caliph Uh, Harun al-Rashid embarked on a major intellectual project. Al-Rashid, after after his passing, his son al-Mamun oversaw the creation of a new library, the House of Wisdom, which was charged with the massive task of translating the major literature of all languages into Arabic. This project, which would soon embrace every known field of scholastic endeavor, laid the foundation for the great advances that the Islamic world would make in mathematics, philosophy, poetry, astronomy, and medicine, advances which would fulfill Harun al-Rashid's ambitions to make Islam the most advanced civilization in the world had ever known. The significance of the developments in Baghdad was not lost upon the scholars of the Talmudic academies in their traditional halls of learning a little way down the river. Baghdad was both the intellectual center of the world and the capital of expanding Islamic empire. The hegemonic aspirations of the Babylonian yeshiva, the Surah and the Pumbedita academies were just as bold with the far smaller Jewish orbit. They already considered Babylon to be the leading spiritual authority in the Jewish world, whilst reluctantly accepting that there were still religions over which the Palestinian yeshiva held sway. The finalizing and editing of the centuries of Talmudic study was to be the pinnacle of their intellectual achievement. The yeshiva would become a fitting equal to and companion for the House of Wisdom. They gave the heads of their academies, first Surah and later Pambadita, the title Gaon or Excellency, to reflect their new self-image. The form- formative discussion in the academy had already come to an end by this time, and the process of compiling and editing the Talmudic discussion had quietly been going on, though we know virtually nothing about it. We do know, though, that the twice-yearly month-long study sessions were still taking place, just as they had done for generations. All we can say with confidence is that when we left the Talmud, the final discussions were taking place in the provincial academies of Surah and Pambedida, And by the time we are able to pick up the story again, it is fully formed, albeit in a fluid oral form at the center of a bustling and intellectually thriving Baghdad, poised to begin its journey from a local scholarly exercise to a classic of world literature. The highly charged intellectual environment in Baghdad created one of the two conditions the Talmud needed if it was to break out of the academies into a wider world. The other was Baghdad's geographical location. At the center of the caliphate's unified polity uh, and international communication network stretching from the Atlantic coast of North Africa to the borders of India. More than anything else, it was these two factors which would bring about and facilitate the dissemination of the Babylonian Talmud to Jewish communities throughout the Islamic world and eventually beyond. Shared ideas, the Talmud, and Islam. You know what? I think maybe that's a good point to stop for today. And we'll come at this uh, again tomorrow, Hashem willing. And uh, we'll continue on right from that point.
hopefully that'll work for you guys and uh hopefully you're enjoying this so far and um i think we're making all right time um yeah so i think that's probably a good thing to call it a break for rocky mountain ratings for today so feel free to join us tomorrow where we're going to continue with his biography on the Talmud. I am just amazed. It's so nice to hear of the actual history and the formation of it and what went on and how it developed. It's, it's, uh, gives us a, a, you know, it's almost like when you go to a a wonderful, uh, restaurant and uh, the cooks, not just cooking in the background and you only smell it. Um, you're actually getting in there and he's explaining to you exactly what he's going to prepare for you. It's almost like that much more tasty when we realize the depth and the history and the changes of uh, history over time that begin to affect and and bring to rise the need to solidify. And uh, you can see that after the the Roman Empire collapsed, you had the rise of the 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 Islam and how that began to solidify the the the, the Talmud into its uh, final form. I mean. It played a factor for sure, but join us for tomorrow and we're going to hear some more about shared ideas between the Talmud and Islam. And I think uh, it's useful information for sure. Um, Hopefully you're getting much out of it. So please, we're going to sign up for today. Join us tomorrow, same time, and we will continue with the Talmud. Have a wonderful, wonderful day, everybody. Bye for now.